This was one of Swami Vivekananda's favorite Upanishads, and it is really a very, I mean, one aspect that shines in one's mind when one reads this Upanishad, it's the great joyfulness that comes out through these, through these mantras. See, now Swami Vivekananda could talk to 7,000 people before microphones were ever invented, and he had no trouble. <laughs> and in, in a room of uh, 30 people, we can't manage to make ourselves heard. So, anyhow, <laughs> I'll just have to talk louder, that's so all. This thing doesn't do very well. The, uh, the joy that comes out of this Upanishad is uh, due to several things. One thing is that it starts with a little boy who is very innocently, is innocently uh, you know, worried about what his father is uh, doing and uh, then it, it goes through instructions to the boy and uh, praising the, the child and in his uh, innocence and sincerity. And then it goes on to explain the very highest concepts, but all in a very joyful and happy manner. So that when just reading this Upanishad, one becomes joyful. It is so... Uh, descriptive of uh, giving different analogies of what a spiritual realization looks like. Now, uh, generally our trouble in trying to achieve this spiritual realization is that we don't realize that everything is already available for us. This spiritual realization is not something that we have to attain, it's something we are that is our own very nature. And for most of us, when we approach spiritual life, the problem is to think that it is something far away, something we've got to do, uh, tremendous austerities for, after all, um, some people stand on their heads, some people hold up one hand, uh, some people... There's so many uh, austerities that we hear about and we look at ourselves and we're enjoying three nice meals a day and uh, good sleep at night and we figure, well, this can't be... We can't be on the path to spirituality because we're not performing these... Uh, tremendous uh, sacrifices and austerities that I've talked about. But you have to remember, this is basically an instruction given to a young boy. It's not meant that he should uh, or would even grasp the idea of these extended uh, austerities. It's something which is, something is pointed out to him and through him to us all uh, what is pointed out is that this is a very natural spiritual realization, is the natural state. Our ordinary state of existence is what is unnatural. We, we are, in a way, standing on our heads without knowing it. 
we put the whole process around in the wrong direction. If Brahman or spiritual realization in any sense as talked about in any uh, spiritual tradition, if that was something that was so difficult and that required such an extensive austerities, there would be not much point in giving it out to people. I mean, then it could really be kept in the forest for a few advanced sages who in, you know, in their, as they attain their perfection in their austerities, uh, they can practice these things. But we have to, one of our big obstacles is that we think that it's difficult to attain spiritual realization. That itself is a totally uh, counterproductive idea. It puts an obstacle in our path that should not be there. We're, we're putting our own obstacles, we're building our own walls to this, to attain this realization. And then we look at these huge walls that we have built and we say, no, I can't possibly climb that. But you had to climb it in order to build it. <laughs> so there is a, uh, you know, there's a, one of the first things that should be uh, done is we should realize what we're trying to achieve already exists. What we're trying to become, we already are. What we're trying to realize, we already know. It's a question of becoming aware of it. It's a question of, first of all, removing the idea that we don't know. And second, to, uh, it's a matter of refining or making the vision clearer. Now, the, uh, today I wanted to start with this, uh, this famous, these two famous uh, verses in the Kato Upanishad that describe the uh, Om. Sarve Veda Yat Padam Amananti. That which all the Vedas, that Padam, that goal which all the Vedas declare. Tapamsi Sarvani Sayadvadanti. That what all austerities aim at. Yadichanto Brahmacharyan Charanti, that which, that desiring which uh, people lead, li lead lives of self-control. Tate Padam, that very goal, Sangrahena in brief. Ravini, I will tell you, Om that it is Om, that goal is Om. And associated with that is the next shloka. Etadhyev Akshara Brahma. This, indeed, this Akshara, this uh, syllable, is Brahman. Etadhyev Aksharam Param. It is the Supreme. Etadhyev Aksharam Nyatva. Nyatva, knowing this Akshara, this uh, syllable, Yo that which is desired, that which is desired, that becomes one's very own. And alambanam shreshtam, this alambana, this support, shreshta is the very highest. Shreshta is the superlative. And uh, it's a superlative form of the of the word of the word, so that that is the like. Uh, uh, let's see, I don't know an exactly an English word, but uh, good, uh, good, better, best. Good is uh, is the declarative. Better is the comparative. Best is the superlative. So this this uh, is the superlative. You know, this this support using uh, using Om as a support that is that is the highest support. That is the highest. Ida the param. That support is the best. Is the highest. 
having known which, having known this support. Brahma Loki, Mahiyate, one is Mahiyate, one is uh, uh, revered in the uh, in the the world of Brahman, or in the you could say even in the among those who are knowers of Brahman. So the question is, what is this home, and why is it so so much revered? But I think uh, what I would like to point out among these verses, just chanting these verses, there is a little to it. There's a joy to it. There's a uh, an exuberance about it. It's not uh, you know, the sage of who, whose words we're quoting here is not just simply uh, making a statement from a pontifical high seat that yes, it is a home. You should. You should concentrate on home. That will be the solution. No, he's saying it's great joy. It's superlative. It's it's beyond all description. So again, it's the enthusiasm, and that enthusiasm is the main ingredient for our spiritual life. Otherwise, we can read all the scriptures and we can quote them uh, from morning to night, and it just. Uh, is, well, I grew up in a tradition in which it was uh, customary, this uh, Jewish, ancient Jewish tradition in which it was customary for people to recite, they recite from the Bible. They get up in the morning and they ceremonially cover themselves in a certain way and uh, they recite the shlokas from the, uh, from the Bible in Hebrew. And, uh, but it is, it is a, uh, there are two kinds of people who do that. One kind of people, they, they go, <laughs> like that, and it goes on and on, and they've done it, you know, for their whole life, and they feel great uh, satisfaction doing it. But they don't communicate that feeling of joy. But there is another way of reciting it in which, uh, you know, that, uh, joyous uh, feeling comes through. And uh, what we're trying to realize is ananda, sat, chit, ananda. We don't want to know what exists. We want to know what is known. And we want to know what is joy. And uh, because joy is the, you know, our troubles are because that joy gets impeded. And we think that the joy has to be manufactured. Uh, that this is something that I have to uh, go out on Lake Tahoe in a speedboat at 50 miles an hour and uh, make as much noise as possible and that will be great joy. <laughs> and it, 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 it is joy to some extent, no doubt. It's, uh, you know, and people do it because they get uh, great joy out of it. But it doesn't have to be. You don't have to. You don't need all these instruments for that joy. That that inner joy is already inside, and it's because 24 hours of the day normally we prevent that joy from manifesting itself. That we don't feel it. So uh, this is the uh, this is the message of the Upanishads that that joy that inner goal that we're trying to attain, that, that thing which seems so difficult and which we, uh, we consider to be, we have to perform austerities, tapasya it is called. We have to perform tapasya. No doubt we have to perform tapasya, but the greatest tapasya is to realize what is, <laughs> what is already. Uh, in existence, and that joy is something which is already within us. It's already the essence of our own being. That's how we can recognize it even when we, a little particle of it appears. That joy is already our very own nature. And the, what the uh, scriptures and all these austerities can do is to reveal that to us, that this is already in existence. And it's something that we simply have to uh, 
it's not something we have to manufacture. It's something that whose covering we have to remove. When that covering is removed, this is why renunciation is always talked about as, as essential uh, for spiritual life. Yes, renunciation is essential. But what is it that we're renouncing? <laughs> we're not renouncing uh, anything that is, uh, you know, we, we have something that is, uh, that we are undertaking. We're going to renounce this. And then uh, somehow we're going to achieve some spiritual result because of that. What we're renouncing is we're renouncing the covering over that joy which is our own inner nature, which is our own reality. And it's, it's uh, all these things which we think uh, are, which we feel that we have to do in order to attain that joy. The scriptures point out that that joy is innate to us and uh, by realizing it, that it is there, by, by understanding that it's something that is very, uh, our very own nature, we become more concentrated on it, we become interested and we, di we direct our attention in the proper direction to, uh, to attain that knowledge. So it's not that we're producing anything, we're directing our attention, we're directing our effort in, a, in that, in order to uh, feel that re as a reality. So we, we go and we uh, do our spiritual practices and we, you know, we, with great effort we do this and that and, and that's good and that's wonderful. But the, the, the fact that we seem to miss is really that is already within us. If we just look a little bit more carefully, a little bit more thoroughly, we'll understand that that is our very own nature already. So religion is one of our swamis. Many of you know him <laughs> or knew him because he passed away in 1995. Uh, Swami Sajananda, he used to say, because in those days, uh, I used to, uh, we had a rule that uh, there had to be two of us going and the monastery going, or shopping or whatever it had to be done outside of the monastery. So I used to be his companion, he had to take someone and I wasn't assigned so many duties so I had more free time. So we used to talk a lot about these spiritual things. And one of the things he said that I clearly remember, that uh, renunciation is not the chopping off of limbs, renunciation is the flowering of the whole tree. And uh, I just thought that was so wonderful because it's descriptive of, uh, you know, really what is, what is happening here. And the Kato Upanishad gives you an example you know, so many examples of this. First of all, because it talks about a little boy uh, and his uh, attempts to understand and realize. And then the, the very, you know, the very expressions, you see. Like, for instance, it tells you about Om, which we'll talk about in a moment. That... Uh, Sarve Veda Yat Padama Amananti, what that goal which all the Vedas declare, Tapamsi Sarvani, all austerities uh, describe, Yadi Chantu Brahmacharya Charanti, that which those uh, spiritual aspirants practice vows of renunciation of Brahmacharya, that I will, that goal is not anything very complex and very uh, convoluted and difficult to attain. Uh, it is all. I will tell you very simply, it is all. Why should you be make a, 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 such a, an abstruse thing out of it? So, but then of course the question arises, all right, in what sense is it all? And what is it that, uh, what is it about this all? Now, uh, Swami Vivekananda talks about it and uh, Shankaracharya also talks about it. But in, in an analytical way, 
What is it about Om that makes it the most highly respected uh, symbol in, uh, in Vedantic uh, tradition? Uh, Swami Vivekananda explains one aspect of it in this way that Om is not actually Om, it's A U Ma. And A and U together, pronounced together, are pronounced Om or Aum. The exact uh, pronunciation is probably a little more inflected than just O. But Aum, it's A U Ma. And in Sanskrit, A and U together acquire that sound. Now, first of all, why should there be any particular sound that is a spiritual, such a profound spiritual symbol uh, as described here in the Kato Upanishad and uh, in the Madhukya Upanishad also, uh, that uh, Om is again declared to be everything. It is everything. That which was in the past that which is now and that which will be in the future, that is Om. So, uh, the word, that concept of Om needs to be uh, analyzed a little, what exactly is meant by that. Now, one aspect that Swamiji mentions, and it, he's not the only one who has mentioned this, but I mean, for, he's put it very clearly, uh, Om is made up of A, U, Ma. That means A, the sound A is, you could say, the first sound in the vocal apparatus. A. At the very beginning, at the, at the lowest point in the throat, A. Then Ma is uh, formed when the lips close, with the lips closed, uh, A, U, Ma. So, between A and M, all possible sounds are included. And then the U is formed in the central part of the mouth. A, U, M is therefore symbolic of all possible sounds, the gamut of sounds. Again, it's symbolism, symbolic of that, the gamut of sounds. So that means it's really the, the the essence of all words. And in order to, uh, words are symbolic of thoughts, ideas. So in a sense, it's symbolic of all ideas, of all thoughts, of all that could be expressed. And in other words, it is, you can <clears throat> stretch it, you're stretching it, it's symbolic, it's a symbol, it's not the, you know, it, it is not the, it is symbolic of the reality. It is, and therefore, it becomes the reality after uh, it has been practiced. But as a symbol, it is. It is uh, just indicates. It's an indica indication of all possible sounds. <clears throat> and then the connection is made between sounds and ideas. That every idea in the mind is represented in some way, in some vocal way. So the sound Om is actually the representative of everything that could be expressed. And uh, we are, of course, it's uh, symbolic. It's symbolic not only what can be expressed, what has been expressed, what might be expressed, you know, and, as the Mandukya Upanishad said, that which is the past, the present, and that which will be the future, all of that is only Om. So uh, this is, uh, again, it's a symbolism. You can't say it's the thing itself. It's the, the thing itself is something that has to be realized, but it is symbolic of the thing itself. In other words, Om is the symb symbol of every possible thought and every possible idea, every possible, it's symbolic of every possible realization. So, Om is that. Uh, then the question is that 
can you realize it to be so or is it only an intellectual description as I'm describing it now? That, uh, that point is also made that it can be realized to be so. That uh, having known that syllable, whatever one desires, one gets that. Uh, then it had Eva Akshara Param, this, this Akshara is indeed, Eva is indeed Brahman, and it is indeed the Supreme, and it had Eva Akshara Mnyatva, having known this, Yoyarichadita that which one desires, one attains. So Om is like the, uh, you could say it's like the thread that shows the way through this maze of life. Following that thread, one comes to the center, the essence, the reality. So uh, this is one, of course, potent spiritual practice and uh, one that is Every, every uh, mantra, every expression always begins and ends with Om, or could uh, begin and end with Om, because Om is symbolic of what is, uh, what we are trying to attain. So here in this Upanishad is one of the joyful, uh, enthusiastic, descriptions. I mean, just by repeating it, you feel that elevation of spirit uh, to the, the joy that is being implied by this. Then, uh, the Upanishad goes on to eulogize this, and uh, it is a number of these verses are also repeated in the Bhagavad Gita. And Najayate Mriyateva, Najayate, it is not born. Na Mriyate, it, is, it does not die. Vipaschinayam Kutaschinna, Bhavuva Kaschit. Uh, the knowing soul is not born, nor does it die. It does not come into being from anything, nor does anything, uh, nor has anything come into being from it. This unborn, eternal, everlasting, ancient one suffers no destruction even when the body is destroyed. Ajo, it is not unborn. Nityaha, it is eternal. Shashvato, yam Purana, that, that ancient, unchanging one. Purana means ancient. Nahanyate, hanyamani, sharire. The hanyamani, sharire, when the uh, the body is killed. It is not killed. So it is that which, and of course that's our main concern, what's going to happen to us. We know that we are here only for a certain period of time and then this thing which we call this body, this personality, some something changes. It no longer becomes evident to uh, to the senses uh, that that whatever was in that form in that body seems seems to have gone away and the body itself remains as an inert thing which is then buried or burnt or gotten rid of in some way but uh, what happens this was the this was Nachiketas's original question what happens to that uh, which seems to have disappeared from the body. The body was, uh, was enlivened by something, and then that something, uh, the, the body then, after some time, the body is no longer enlivened by anything. It is obviously just a, a thing. It's a, uh, a piece of matter. It's something that decays. And uh, the only thing one can do with it is to burn it or bury it. So what is it that has left? Uh, and so this is, a, this is the, uh, the statement here. 
there is something within us there is something within us the knowing soul he calls it here in this translation is not born nor does it die it has not come into being from anything nor has anything come into being from it it is unborn eternal everlasting ancient the ancient one in other words the ancient one means it's a conscious reality this is what is within you see this is now Chiketas's question original question was this how what happens uh, a person is said to be dead and uh, some people say that that being still exists and others say no he does not exist so what is the truth about it so uh, Yama is here explaining these things. It is not born, that thing which is within us. Now we have to uh, bring all this back down to ourselves, otherwise it just becomes a piece of beautiful literature which we can quote and appear to be nice and learned, but it doesn't really affect us internally at all. What we want is something that will answer our basic question, and our basic question is, where do I come from? And where do I go? I know I'm going to have to, uh, this is just a temporary sojourn, but what happens to this? Is everything that I'm doing now going to just simply going to vanish into thin air and as though it had never been? Then what's the sense of my doing anything? It Does anything remain or does it not remain? This is the, and then the, this is this uh, enthusiastic, again, joyful answer. It does not, it is not born, this thing that you are asking about. It, it, is, it is not born and it does not die. You know, this is, the, this is the basic message, this is the gospel, the good news. This is the good news. These people who have uh, achieved this realization, they have they have lived to understand this, to know this, to actually experience it, and they pass this on to us. It is not born nor does it die. It has not come into being from anything, nor has anything come into being from it. A person may have, you know, may have children and thinks these are my children. <coughs> well, they are your children from the, you know, in the ordinary standpoint, and these are things you know, realities that you have to understand. And not only that, there's also a certain a great feel, deal of love and feeling and emotion associated with it that makes us feel, makes us feel that these beings, fathers, mothers, children, uncles, aunts, all those, these are our very own. But that's all at this particular level. At the deepest, uh, from the deepest standpoint, from the deepest reality, this whole world is our own. Not just our own children, our own children, our own relatives. But we have to feel that same way toward everyone. Because what Natchikesa is asking sounds like I'm asking a question for my own self. Uh, where do I come from uh, and where do I go? And where do my own near ones and dear ones come from and where do they go? But that has to be expanded to the whole universe. Every, everything, everywhere is like that. They are, there was, there's only one reality in this whole universe. And nothing has come from it and nothing is going to go away, from, you know, because that, that, only that reality is the essence. Everything else, I have added on to it. And when I ask, where does all this go? Uh, children ask, where do their parents go? What has happened to them? The parents were there and then they pass away. Well, this is the natural course of events, but what is it that comes and goes? What is it that comes and goes is a physical thing, a psychological thing, but not a spiritual thing. The spiritual reality is present right now, has always be, been present, will always be present. And this is the good news. This is the gospel. The knowing soul is not born. 
nor does it die. It has not come into being from anything, nor has anything come into being from it. It is, in, in, it is something which always has always existed and will always exist. It is existence itself. This unborn, eternal, everlasting, ancient one suffers no destruction even when the body is destroyed. That is the, the main message within us. The essential part of it, not just an accidental or peripheral part of us, the, the essential uh, internal uh, part of us is an eternal reality. The fact that we feel ourselves to be time-bound and limited is because we are concentrating on the body and the mind. But within each one of us is that infinite and eternal reality. That is that first thing, that's the first conviction we have to have. There's no point in going after anything too terribly involved, abstruse and complicated if that basic idea has not been thoroughly mastered. Within me is an eternal consciousness, an eternal reality that has not come into being and will not go. And no matter what I've done, if I've done tremendously wonderful things that the world, whole world praises me for, or if I've done ghastly things that I wish had, uh, you know, that I could forget, all these things are on the surface. They have their own consequences. I have to deal with them, certain things, certain causes are generated by them, certain effects have to be dealt with, okay. But none of it is essential. What is essential is that I am, by nature, that infinite reality. And that is, the, that is my own true self, that is my own reality, that is present right here and now. There's nothing I have to do to affirm it or to uh, to prove it, I don't, uh, even if I don't do any spiritual practices at all, that will not change this, it will only change the, the, uh, the time or the, it will change my perception. I, will, I may feel myself limited and uh, bound and subject to all sorts of uh, problems if I don't uh, if I don't realize this, but the actual reality of what is going on cannot change, will never change. I am the infinite and the eternal. That is the truth about me, no matter what you or anybody else can do to me. It will never change. So the, this is the uh, basic message. Now then, that being the case, of course, I begin to feel an urgency. Uh, yes, I want to realize this. I want to prove that this is so. Then if the killer thinks that he is killing, and if the killed thinks that he is killed, both of whom know it not, it kills not, nor is it killed. Hanta chain manyati hantum. Hanta the killer chain if the killer manyate, if it is, if the killer thinks to, to kill, that he is uh, doing the killing, that's one aspect. But the other and more uh, mysterious aspect is hatas chain manyate hatam hataha, the, the one who has been killed, chain, if manyate, he thinks hatam, I am killed. Upautau, both of these, Navijanita, they then, neither one of them knows. Nayam hanti nahanyate, it does not kill nor is it killed. Hanti and hanyate, one is the active voice, the other one is the passive voice. It kills and it is, not, and it is killed. Neither of those is true. Now those are, you know, you have to think about these things. Those are really profound, uh, world-shaking ideas. The person who thinks he is, uh, <clears throat> if the killer thinks that he is killing, and the killed thinks that he is killed, both of them know not, it kills not, nor is it killed. Okay, immediately you will say, well, now, wait a minute. 
if uh, you're in a way saying it doesn't matter if the killer kills. No, this is, we're not talking about a, uh, a moral plane. We're not talking about a judicial plane. We're not talking about a, uh, an actual realistic event type plane. We're talking about a spiritual reality, the spiritual essence. On the moral plane, if you kill, you have to pay certain consequences possibly if you're killing, you know, if you, those conditions that are laid down under which killing can be done and not done. But these, but these are all details that we can argue about. Those things you, you'll be subject to, that is to say the limited aspect of you, the body will be subject to it if the body and the mind do killing, then the body and the mind will have to suffer for the consequences or if they uh, are able to conquer that urge, they'll, be, they'll enjoy it. So the body and the mind suffer and they enjoy. That will be there. But the reality, what is actually happening, None of these things is happening at all. And it's, the, it's that that we have to keep in mind. On the, on the surface plane, that is the, the plane where, uh, you know, the mental and the physical plane, there will be these consequences. And if the wrong thing or an inadvertent thing is done, whatever it is, the, the consequences uh, may follow for that. That is another story. But what is actually the reality? What is actually happening here? Nothing is actually happening here at all. That which is, has always been, and, and will always be. So underneath are surface problems, which we have to deal with. Underneath are our shortcomings in the physical and psychological plane. There is an ocean of joy. And whether we, we uh, solve these psychological brains or, uh, and, and physical uh, problems or not, that level of joy remains. It, will, it is not affected by anything. The reality remains unchanged. On the physical and mental levels, we have to, our actions have their own results. We, then, the entity that does the action has to pay, but it's the, the body pays for what the body does, the mind pays for what the mind does, the spirit is totally unaffected, and the spirit is our own reality. When all this is over, actually death is a wonderful thing, because all of these conflicting obligations in life, what I should do, what I should not do, what I should have done, uh, or what I should not have done, they cause us so much misery. Why did I do this? And that seemed that would burden us forever, as long as we remember we did this particular thing that we so much regret, we will always remember that. It is a constant burden. But the, but the uh, this is only on that plane. That burden will be there. But we have to remember that this is on that plane alone. On the, as far as the reality factor is concerned, there was no killing and there was no one killed. Only the Atman is. Om is the, is the reality of past, present and future. So what is that Atman that does not die? That is the, uh, that is the point. That is what has. To, what is it within us? It, we know very well what it is within us that dies, or that suffers psychologically. That we know. But what is that thing with, uh, within us which does not die, which is infinite and eternal? That is the question that uh, we have to answer. And then, Kato uh, is such wonderful verses. Atman smaller than the smallest and greater than the greatest dwells in the heart of creatures. Those who are desireless being free from grief realize that glory of the Atman through the purity of the senses and the mind. Now, uh, renunciation is the, the key discipline. 
Why is renunciation the key discipline? Because it's the renunciation of everything that is limited. By renouncing everything that is limited, what is it that is left? Well, normally we say nothing is left because everything that I understand, everything that I experience is limited. It's either psychological or physical. And uh, we, don't, we have no idea of anything that transcends this. The, the message of the scriptures, the message of the sages is behind all of the things that we normally consider in our lives and in our in our study in our mental on our mental horizon interpenetrating everything without which we could not think anything without which we could not in the Brahadaranyaga Upanishad it's that which the the without which we could not think, without which we could not do anything, without which we could not even regret anything. There is that one reality which enables everything, which makes everything possible. That is the Atman, that is our own nature, that is our own reality. So we have to find out what is this Atman, what is this unchanging reality. And of course, certain things are said about it. Satchit Ananda, Asti Bhati Priya. Uh, it is first, uh, the first realization, which is what uh, Yama is telling Nachiketas. It is, it exists. That's the first assurance of the scriptures. There is that reality we're talking about that is beyond the body and the mind, yet interpenetrating everything here, the reality even of the body and the mind, it exists, asti. These are, these are words from Sri Ramakrishna, this example of a, uh, a field, uh, some friends are walking in a field and they come to an area that's surrounded by a huge wall and they hear sounds of merriment coming out of that field. Great joy seems to be happening inside beyond this wall. So they desperately want to find out what is this. They look around and they find a ladder. They climb the ladder and the first one climbs up and they say, okay, I will tell you what it is. First one climbs up to the top, looks over and sees such an astounding view that he simply jumps over and forget. Ooh, he forgot. He forgot to, but he's gone now. <laughs> so the other two are down below looking. Okay, the second one goes up. I will tell you. I will give you back. And then he jumps over and silence for the, the poor person who's remaining down below. What is it? What is it? So that person, the third person, goes up and he sees what tremendous joy there is. Then he says, okay, there are other people there. I have to, I, I have to give this news to the others. And those are the scriptures. Those are the words of the scriptures. These are the sages who have experienced this, who have understood this, who have realized it. And they give us these words as their best attempt to explain what this is. And it's up to us to take this as a kernel. Now, the mantra is frequently uh, said to be a kernel that the, the guru gives. It is a kernel of uh, something that has to be developed, like a seed. Bija mantra is one of the aspects of the mantra. It is a seed that has to be developed, to be nourished, to be watered, to be uh, fertilized, to have a soil put around it to, so that the plant can grow. So the Upanishads are to be thought of as seeds. You take these sayings as, as a mantra. Uh, and, but one thing that the Upanishads uh, communicate, which is, uh, you know, it's very important, the, not only do you communicate the news, but the reality, you're standing on top of the wall and you're watching this, this wonderful feast or uh, uh, celebration that's going on down below, 
and you want to tell the other people about it, the one thing that's really essential to motivate anyone to undertake this process is to communicate that joy. And that is the, that's one of the prime uh, functions which the Upanishads uh, convey so well. I mean, the, it, they're written in poetry, they're written in, they're like songs, they're like exuberant uh, expressions of great joy. Anoraniyan mahato mahiyan. It is the smallest, <laughs> it is smaller than the small, Anu is very small. Smaller than the smallest, mahato mahiyan. It is greater than the greatest. Atmasya jantor nihito guhayam. The the Atman is uh, present in the in the hearts in guha in the cave in the cave in the in that sacred space within each person. The region, it's thought to be a cave, or a region, it's also mentioned in other Upanishads, uh, like a region, in the region of the heart, it is a cave or a, a sacred space. And uh, sometimes I remember going to a temple in South India, I think it was Kamakshi Temple, and, uh, and Kamakshi and also Meenakshi in uh, Madurai, there is a, uh, I mean, the Sanctum Sanctorum is a tiny, tiny little place inside this huge temple with enormous gopurams and, uh, you know, but inside it's just a tiny space. I don't know, maybe five people can fit in it. Uh, you know, the priest and, and a few others, you give him the offerings and the, the, the image is right there. You see it right there. So it is a, uh, you know, it, it is in the, the symbol is in our own hearts, inside our own hearts. It's a small space. It's very small, but the Atman is, that is thought to be within, in the hearts of our beings. Why is it the region of the heart? Because as long as we read these things as intellectual things that have to be analyzed and uh, I have to find the correct pronunciation and I have to make sure that the case endings are correct and. Uh, and did I copy this down right? Yes, and then I repeat it. That's at one level, and it's good, and it's worthwhile and wonderful. But uh, that's, it's still, I'm analyzing it in the, in the head. You know, how does it come? How does it appear? Where, where, what's the origin of it? What are the proofs that this exists, that I'm not being deluded, and so forth? This is all in the head. But when that enthusiasm begins to go to the level of the heart, to the level of feeling, then you begin to, you know, it, it begins to take on life. As long as it's in, only an intellectual pursuit, it is at one level. And it's great and has its advantage, no problem. But it doesn't become alive until the heart opens up, until you feel the, the existence of this. I mean, if you see your own mother, you know, you see so many ladies there, but your own mother gives you something, just seeing her, something opens up in one's heart. The mother is not just like other, other people. So in this same sense, this space, this reality that is present in our own self, it has to be, I mean, the, the, the beauty of it has to be cultivated so that it itself will manifests itself as a sense of sweetness in the heart, as a, sen as a sense of joy within. And then things begin, the spiritual life begins to be, you know, assume a three-dimensional aspect instead of just being theoretical. So this is Atman smaller than the smallest, greater than the greatest, dwells in the heart of creatures. The desireless one, being free from grief, realizes that glory of the Atman through the purity of senses in the mind. And this gives you the, the, the practice to realize these things. Desireless, why should one be desireless? 
because desires are in the way, get in the way of seeing what is. Desire means that you're, you want something which, which you don't have. So you want to know something which you do not know or realize something which you do not have not realized or enjoy something that, uh, that uh, you have not yet enjoyed. But the Atman is already present. It's not a question of making it our own. It's a question of realizing it, that it is there already, fully our <coughs> own. In other words, there was one uh, statement quoted by Swami Vivekananda in his talks at Thousand Island Park. Uh, do not <coughs> seek him, see him. In other words, you're seeking something which is already the essence of your own being, and you're looking for it outside, like the musk deer, that's the ancient musk deer. From its navel comes the, uh, this scent of musk, but it doesn't know that it's coming from its own being, so it runs here and there trying to find it. That joy is already within us. It's already within our own hearts. It is the reality within us. And we're looking for it outside. So that is why one should be desireless. Not that it's bad to desire to do this or that, either drive a sports car or whatever. Those are trivial things. That's nothing. Yeah, okay, well, maybe I can't afford it. All right, from a practical standpoint, okay, you know. But the thing is, these physical and, and uh, you know, mental desires simply are there because you don't know what's already inside us. Once you realize what's already inside us, then what of all this? Sports car, this car, what car? All right, let it go. It doesn't matter much. Because I've got inside me what I really, uh, you know, what is the core of my own being. I've got that reality already within. I have accomplished everything that should have been accomplished already. I was born that way. So when I die, that will not change. That is the answer to Nachiketa's question. What happens when a person dies? None of that changes. Other people will see the person is dead and there'll be a feeling of sorrow, no doubt, because of associations and so forth. That is true. But as far as the essence is concerned, nothing at all has happened. That infinite has been there and will be there is the essence of everything that is there. Though sitting still, it travels far. Though lying down, it goes everywhere. Who beside me can know that effulgent being who rejoices and rejoices not? So this is the, uh, the this is the, the, the thing. The, all of these things, it is everywhere, it is all pervading, it travels far. Though lying down, it goes everywhere. I think it may be here, it is also there. That was what we said uh, before, last time we were talking about Kato Upanishad. Uh, what is here is there. What is there is here. <coughs> he goes from death to death, who, as it were, sees any difference here. There is no difference here. And it is in our own consciousness that these things are true. In our, in our own consciousness, our own consciousness is that reality. The full knowledge of God is totally already within us. There's nothing we have to do to get it. There's no we have nothing to attain that we have not already fully and completely attained. It's a question of, by quieting down, that exterior noise, slowly we become aware of what is already calling from within all the time. What is impelling us towards spiritual realization now? Why are we all here listening, looking for spiritual depth, spiritual <coughs> understanding, if we didn't have it already within us, if we didn't already know that such a thing is already within us, that prompting us to make efforts to look at it, to find it, to find it, the reality of it already within us. 
So the, uh, that itself is causing us to, uh, to try to find it. And this, is, uh, this brings up one of the uh, verses that has frequently caused some confusion in, uh, or some questions. And uh, it is, this is the verse, I am Atma Pravachanena Labhyaha. This Atman cannot be attained by Pravachana. Pravachana is uh, actually, basically it's a study and teaching of the Vedas. I am Atma Pravachanena Labhyaha. Na Medhaya. Not, uh, not, but Medha is, is intelligence or intellect, not by the intellect. Not, bahuna shrutena, not by quoting many scriptures as I've been doing. See, <laughs> that itself is not, that itself is, uh, is, not, is not, that is not one of the essential things for attaining the, uh, attaining that reality. Nayam atma pravachanena labhya na medhaya na bahuna shrutena. Okay, now, Fine, it's not to be attained by this, that, and the other, but by, by what is it to be attained? Yame vaisha vrunute tena labhyaha tasyaisha atma vi vrunute tanum swam. So, what is it? This, is the, this expression has caused some uh, confusion. Yame vaisha vrunute. And it is translated, it is attained by whom it chooses. So the Atma is attained by whom the <coughs> Atman chooses. So that can be interpreted to bring, and that gives also the, uh, uh, the this, uh, you know, seeing all religions as being paths to that same reality, that uh, this, this self is realized by what? By whom it chooses. It is attained by whom it chooses. That the, the literal, trans, literal transition, Esha Vrinute, by whom it tena, by him, Labhyaha. By him it is to be attained. By whom, Yena, Esha Vrinute, by whom it chooses. So does it mean God has to choose you in order to, for you to reach that? And of course, this allows for all religions to come under the banner. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing because it can be interpreted by each religion in its own way and it'll be all right. So some would say that uh, it is attained by him alone whom God chooses. But, it can, but uh, Shankaracharya interpreted the passage as that is chosen by the very self, the very Atman which the aspirant seeks. It is chosen. It is chosen by our own self. In other words, our own self becoming aware of its limitations becoming aware of the existence of an enormous sea of joy which we are not able to get by that inner awareness by our own inner self when it is chosen by that it is that realization dawns or oh, but it can equally well be said by god when it is by god's grace it comes god has chosen that you should realize this and by through God's grace it is realized. All these interpretations can be are valid. All these interpretations can be uh, justified. In other words, there is whatever path you adopt is the right path. <laughs> It'll get you there. Okay, it's different from my path and it's different from another person's path. But whichever path you choose, you cannot avoid it. Spiritual realization, no matter how much you avoid it, you cannot avoid it. You must realize God. Because until you realize God, you will not be satisfied. And that is the, uh, that really is the essence of, uh, in fact, that is the essence of it. And probably the time has come exactly. So, thank you. Are there any 
thoughts, comments, ideas. Or maybe everybody is so stunned <laughs> that no thought will come. I, I've always found a little contradiction in, in, the con in, 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 in two different concepts. One is this concept that you just said, you know, behind everything is the Atman. It, it was never created, it, 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 it'll never pass away. It's, it's all the time there, and it's there. It's a fact, right? Then there is the reincarnation. And the two things kind of don't match very well. Well, the, the connection is this, that uh, it's true the body dies, no doubt about that. We have, you know, Millions of years of evidence of that. <laughs> Nobody has survived yet, and uh, there's not much chance that, that we're going to be the one that's going to survive, you know, without death. So that much is true, the body dies. But what happens to the mind? Uh, energy is conserved on the physical plane, no doubt. Uh, that uh, can be verified uh, scientifically, no problem. But what about the psychological plane? What about all these intense desires? You can imagine a person, ordinary people, not very intense. But uh, some people have enormous passion toward accomplishing something. And years and years they put into that. Tremendous energy is put into that and uh, suddenly they pass away. So, why should one say that uh, nothing, no, none of that psychic, psychic energy survives? Physically, it doesn't. Psychologically, there's no reason to assume that there's, I mean, it would be unreasonable to say that nothing remains of that. Now, that's not a proof. It's a, a plausibility argument only. Uh, but uh, you also have to explain great geniuses from their very birth who can, uh, are so outstanding that uh, people stand in all of their accomplishments. Mozart, for instance, at the age of five, wrote exquisite music. And uh, you could say, okay, well, it was an accident, this way or that, but that's not scientific either. You, look, you should look for a reason. So uh, the idea is that previously, this, uh, so much energy had been built up musically, it came out, poured out of him, even at the age of five. Um, in other words, the, the, this, this is uh, the idea of the reincarnation, that uh, something remains to be done, and the Gita mentions all these things, uh, that uh, such a person with, who has had excellent spiritual tendencies and so forth, if the job is not finished, the realization has not been attained, then uh, it will, he, will be, he or she will be born in the home of the pure and the prosperous and put very soon, the, uh, put again that uh, knowledge that he had in his previous birth will again be uh, available to him uh, for him to continue that project that he was so intensely uh, involved with before he passed away. So I, I think, anyway, on the basis of that, we assume, although direct, immediate proof is not available, we assume that this is a continuous process and that one develops oneself in whatever direction one wants. We are our own friend, we are our own enemy. And we try to be our friend, but sometimes we are not. But anyway, this is a process that goes on. And eventually the, uh, the circumstances are such that that uh, you know, higher world opens up. Isn't there a hazard in the physical analogy? I mean, say you take the law of entropy, you say you have built up a great deal of spiritual merit, won't that degrade according to the laws of entropy? 
of course, according to oh, entropy. <laughs> Will it work in this field? According to entropy, you, you know, you know, energy. I mean, the laws of energy conservation say you can only put in, um, get out what you put in. The entropy, the second law of thermodynamics says you can't even get out that much. <laughs> So I, I, I think my, my question went more to, you know, if, if the Atman is the essence of man, what migrates? Because the Atman is, is, is not affected, right? Yeah. So is, is, there, is there different, an, another layer in, in the human being that is migrating? Because we, we, we hear about the migration of the soul, but this Upanishad says, no, no, the soul is not involved in that thing at all. No, there's no migration of the soul. I mean, if you say, according to these, this uh, uh, philosophy, according to this tabulation, the body, mind, and spirit, those are there. The spirit never moves. It does not, this Upanishad says quite clearly, it does not come, it does not go, it has not come from anything, it's not going anywhere. It is. That reality is the eternal present. The body thinks it's in a certain location and subject to certain forces, and it lives, and then it, after some time it passes away, and then it again appears, and then again passes away, like that. The, but the spirit, it's like a... Uh, a movie, when you're looking in a movie, you see many different things are happening. So you're saying, oh, I saw this movie and I saw that uh, uh, someplace else this was happening and another place something else was happening. Uh, but when the lights come on, you suddenly realize that you weren't seeing anything at all except a piece of cloth in different kinds of illumination. So that whole world that you imagined to exist in this movie was not there at all. I mean, you know that. Uh, psychologically, in the back of your mind, you know it. But while you're seeing it on the screen, you're overwhelmed by this and uh, great enthusiasm and great uh, uh, or energy or horror or joy or whatever it happens, depending on what you see on the screen. But when the lights come on, None of that was there, but the screen remains. So in the same sense, that Atman, that inner reality, simply remains in different scenes. Swami Vivekananda makes that point. Different scenes come before it, and it either enjoys or suffers, and then these scenes go away and other scenes come up. The point is that what we're trying to do is to see that those scenes are not the essence of what we're looking at. We're not trying to say that anything is false. We're trying to say that what we're looking at is only the superficial aspect. What is the reality of what we're seeing? Well, the, in the case of the movie, the reality is the screen. It's, that's the reality of what we're seeing. Everything else is a, uh, a play of lights and shadows with uh, due to uh, retention in the eyes and all that we connect, although these are many different frames that are seen, you know, in the movie we connect all these frames into one whole and we make it one movie and so forth. But we've done that. What's actually there is nothing but a, but a screen in different kinds of illumination. No, I understand that, but, you know, when you see the movie, you're done with the movie, you see the screen, and the guy in the projection room goes home and, and they shut down the theater, right? But transmigration basically says we don't shut down the theater. It's, it's no, nobody takes the screen away. But the screen is always there. The screen is the reality. Sometimes the screen appears as uh, this type of motion picture, sometimes it appears as that type of motion picture. But the screen is always there. The screen is our own reality. That's, that's what we want to see. Is the screen our reality or is the projection our reality, the projector our reality? No, the screen is our reality. The, the projector, our projection is what we see on that screen. But instead of 
discriminating very carefully. That's why Vairagya is, you know, I mean, Viveka is so important. Viveka is discrimination. Viveka Ananda, because he was able to penetrate to the reality of what he was seeing, and the reality was God, and that these different appearances that he, this world that he's looking at is a projection on the reality of God. God is the only reality. Brahman, the Atman is the only reality. On that, we have, in that's in some mysterious process that we don't fully understand, we projected this whole universe on the reality of God. Actually, only God is there. Saram Kaligam Brahma. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to say. It, it really, the only thing that is really there is the projection, I mean, the thing that is projecting, that is real. We see it, we see the project, we see the projection, but I mean, actually the, what is projected is not real, what is... What is real is the screen. It, what which, is projecting is what's real. No, what is projecting is the different kinds of illumination. No, you can't take the, uh, if you take the analogy, every analogy can be carried to a, an extreme. The analogy here is that what we're seeing is, in other words, whatever we're seeing is really there. This world is really there, but it, what we should be seeing is what is the reality of this world. The reality of this movie that we're seeing is the screen, not the, uh, the shadows that are projected on it are our own, we construe that. <coughs> We've, out of the different aspects of light, we've constructed a an image that says, okay, this is happening. So my understanding is, is that the screen itself is unreal. The project, the projector, whatever is that ultimate source is, is the real, the reality. Well, okay, you go, you can take it. <laughs> <laughs> this is a real fair. <laughs> I guess the question probably was uh, in the uh, example of Mozart, you know, you know, what was that move from one body to another? Is it another layer or she? Or Atman didn't change, but the samskara or the impressions of his music, previous musical talent, which manifested in the next life, what is that? That I think, I don't know. Something gets passed on mm -hmm. from yeah. life to mm -hmm. life. Yes. Something. There's a ah. five koshas, is there anna my kosha, prana my kosha, the five scenes in there, and some passes away. And finally, is there ananda my kosha when we reach there? No, again, ananda my kosha is the, the lowest one, the and but that too is a kosha. Mm -hmm. yeah. The Atman shines through all these koshas. I mean, if you use an example, you always. <coughs> You always miss the point in some aspect or other. It's the, uh, you know, what it's trying to illustrate is whatever we see, there is a core of reality here. That is all, you know. When you use, when you cited an example, you can always say, well, the example is not fully satisfactory. And, and of course, that is true. No example is going to be fully satisfactory. but. What we're trying to illustrate is this, that the Atman is the light that we're, is the light within, is that which makes everything visible. That's what I was trying to say. I think it is that which is behind the Adamana uh, Kosha and all the other Koshas, that is the reality. Well, there you're talking about yes, a different analysis. You're coming. You see, you're using the opposite ring. I've got the light coming from here, bouncing on the screen, and you've got the light coming from within the screen, shining yes. up. And it's absolutely correct because it's the uh, the Upanishad makes this point that the uh, that the, the the light that percolates through all these sheets that is the Atman. That is the the reality. Yeah, that's right. Shamiji, what happens like in real life, we see a, you know, Vivekananda or a Christ coming, right? So these are all projections. What happens to their, you know, Atman that, that, that disappears when they go away? The Atmans are not there anymore, right? 
Boy, if you say that, <laughs> <laughs> this is serious. <laughs> so you, you don't see that projection anymore, right? When the projection ceases, see one of the one of the prime aspects of the projection is the sense that I am seeing a projection. I'm making three things. You know, the Tripudi Laya is called the there's the observer, there's the object the, the that which is observed, there's the process of observation. All three things disappear. They all disappear at once. You can't say just one thing disappears. Everything, the whole of reality is known. They, I mean, we can argue in uh, about little details here and there, but and every example has this problem that, uh, thank you, that uh, it's going to be, no example is going to be perfect. But the, the, the message that we're trying to put across is that, uh, that the, the reality, the, the essence of what we are observing is, uh, shines through every observation. That every observation, every thought, is a perception of the ultimate reality, filtered through various materials of our own uh, personality, own bodies and minds. Uh, that, but the, the point is that the, the that is being made here is that that whatever it is that we're deeply looking for, our deepest wishes, our deepest desires and hopes and aspirations are actually manifested at present, fully, every moment. And if we uh, follow the leading the directions of these scriptures and of the spiritual teachers, we will also perceive that, that that reality is fully present all the time and uh, available in all conditions under all circumstances as the essence of every perception. God is present right now fully, eternally manifest Whatever our experiences, past, present, future, whether we live or die, that only applies to the, uh, the, super, uh, the superficial elements within us. There is that ultimate reality within us is fully present and cannot, it is our own, it is our own reality. When you say I, actually you mean that. You cannot get away from it. And that's the idea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>